Okay, so good morning to all of you. Yeah, so today we will be continuing our uh, discussion on deriving the conservation laws. So we will uh, again uh, revisit some aspects of uh, the momentum equation derivation and from there we will continue and complete it and then look at uh, the derivation of energy equation. Okay, so let us uh, look at the uh, uh, momentum equation the derivation today first. Uh, let us consider uh, the control volume in rectangular coordinate system. So now uh, we have to apply the Newton's law which says that the force vector is equal to the rate of change of acceleration, the acceleration times the uh, mass so which, which, was, which is essentially required to balance all the forces which are acting on this control volume and uh, we already have expressed the total derivative of velocity in terms of the partial derivative so we will equate both sides okay. So let us just quickly try to uh, uh, summarize the forces which are acting on this control volume. So essentially you have the normal stresses let us put our coordinate system origin as x, y and z okay. So we have uh, the respective dimensions of this control volume as delta x, delta y and delta z. We uh, will start with the body forces, uh, the body forces acting are gx, uh, rho g x, rho g y and rho g z okay. So these are the volumetric forces. So the acceleration so this this is the force per unit volume so that therefore you have the gravitational acceleration times the density and of course when you put these forces for the entire control volume you have to multiply by the control volume to calculate the net force on this control volume. Similarly when we look at the influence of forces as we discussed there are two kinds of forces one is your uh, volumetric force. which includes uh, of course in our case the gravity. Number two are your surface forces okay. So these surface forces can be split into two categories one is your pressure force and uh, the other is your viscous forces which include your normal and your shear stresses so coming back let us uh, include all these forces on this control volume so let us begin with the the normal shear stress you have uh, sigma xx acting on this face on the left hand side on an x plane and on the right hand side on the x plane you have sigma xx plus d sigma xx by dx delta x of course this is the stress and uh, to get the force you have to multiply by the corresponding area of cross section. So I am going to show only the forces uh, in two directions otherwise it becomes too cumbersome on this control volume. So you can extrapolate and include the forces in the third direction also. Similarly we have uh, sigma yy okay and sigma yy this is sigma yy delta x delta z this is sigma yy plus d sigma yy by dy into okay so this is going to be delta y into delta x okay similarly you have uh, the normal stress in the z direction. Now coming to the shear stresses now these normal stresses act in the direction of the area normals okay which point away from the surface. So if you include the pressure forces which also act normal but they are compressive in nature okay. So the pressure forces act in this direction okay and now the representation that I am using for sigma okay xx this includes my pressure force and the normal 
shear stress okay so this is the complete stress tensor that I am using to denote both the pressure as well as the uh, viscous shear which is acting normal to the phase okay so similarly I will go ahead and uh, include the uh, viscous shear ta acting tangential to the phases now if you look at the notation as I said the uh, the second index here okay the last index corresponds to the direction in which the force is acting and the first index is act denotes the plane on which the force is acting okay so if you want to for example say I want to calculate what is the uh, shear stress acting tangential to this x plane on the left side okay so let, let me say that this force is acting in the downward direction you can also say the force is acting in the upward direction and you will get up get to the same result but in our case we will say that this is acting in the downward direction so this will be tau so the last notation index should be y and what should be the first x okay so corresponding to that now this force should cause a turning moment in the anticlockwise direction so this counterpart on the right hand side should be pointing upward okay so this should be tau xy plus d tau xy by dx delta x and once again this is a stress you have to multiply by the corresponding area so, so on and so forth so similarly if you consider uh, a stress which is acting tangential on the bottom surface so we will indicate this as uh, tau can you say what it should be tau tau y x okay and similarly on the top so now this will cause a clockwise moment okay so this should be tau y x plus d tau y x by d y delta y and this should be multiplied by delta x delta z okay. So similarly you can uh, fill up the other stresses so totally if you put all these stresses together in a uh, tensor form you expand the tensor you actually get a matrix and uh, these are the elements of the matrix you have the normal uh, stresses which include the normal viscous stress as well as the pressure so this will form the diagonal elements of this matrix and you have the tangential uh, viscous stresses which act the off diagonal elements tau x z and this is this is your tau y x tau y z so tau z x tau z y tau z z okay so there are totally nine components so we have three normal components and six tangential components out of the six uh, so I will quickly show which are the other components acting on these faces and you can fill up fill the rest so you have already two denoted here so the other will be we can take case where it is acting this way on the top surface and this should be what tau yz right and uh, you can also take a plane uh, which is in the z direction a z plane and uh, you can talk about a force which is acting in the uh, along the x direction so this should be tau zx okay and you can also have the same z plane you can have uh, stress which is acting tangential pointing in the y direction so this should be tau zy and what else so you have 1 2 3 4 5 so one more so you can look at this left and right plane so you can have again a stress which is acting in the z direction right on an x plane so this will be tau x z okay so this completes all the six viscous stresses acting tangential and the three remaining normal stresses which are acting normal to the surface areas so with this uh, uh, we will go ahead and calculate what is the net force acting on this control volume okay so we we know the force acting on each phase so we have to say this for the, the forces which are acting in along the positive xyz directions are 
or the forces in the net forces in that particular direction okay so we will calculate the net force which gives you the left hand side part of this newton's law so let us calculate the net force in the x direction okay so if you balance these forces in the x direction what should be the uh, net force of course you have your gravitational force okay per unit volume if you multiply it by the volume of the control volume that will be the net force acting on that control volume and uh, what should be the other uh, shear stress terms plus d sigma xx by dx okay plus d tau yx by dy plus d tau zx by dz and of course this has to be multiplied by delta x delta y delta z right so similarly the forces in the other directions now you can fill them yourself so the thing is this you know you are if you look at your notation you can see that the force acting along the x direction will have uh, the stress pointed in that direction and of course you have uh, the the gradient of these force in in a particular direction in all the three directions okay you have in the x direction y direction and z direction so those have have, have to be also accounted for okay so similarly if you look at the net forces acting along the y direction you have sigma yy by dy plus del tau so what should be this term right here xy by dx plus d tau zy by dz so this should be the gravity in i'm sorry this should be in the y direction and this should be in the okay so this this consists of the net forces uh, acting on this uh, control volume faces and we have also expanded the total derivative so let us uh, equate them and before we do that there is one more thing which i want to indicate that although there are six uh, of these uh, viscous forces which are acting tangential out of that we will use the identity that uh, the forces at tau xy should be equal to tau yx and similarly tau xz should be equal to tau zx and tau yz should be equal to tau zy okay so this will reduce the number of unknowns from 6 to 3 okay so why this is required i think uh, i leave this as an exercise for you you can check you can take the case of a two dimensional uh, control volume okay you can uh, balance the forces and you can see for yourself that for example in this case you have tau xy acting here you have uh, tau xy plus d tau xy by dx into delta x and bottom you have tau yx and here you have uh, tau yx plus d tau yx by dy into delta y now this of course you know the dimensions of this are delta x and delta y now if if you want uh, to make sure that there is no rotational movement on this control volume okay that comes from the fact that uh, the acceleration if you reduce your delta x and delta y as as delta x and delta y go to zero so the acceleration of this the angular acceleration that we are looking at should not go to infinity okay so if you denote the angular acceleration so this is your angular displacement and if you denote your angular acceleration as uh, 
uh, I'm going to use the notation here as d square yeah alpha by dt square okay so this should not go to infinity so this condition can be satisfied only if there is no imbalance in these forces so that that should be uh, possible only under this condition only if your tau xy is equal to tau yx there will not be any imbalance which will rotate the fluid motion okay and therefore at uh, the limiting case where your delta x and delta y becomes a point the angular acceleration should not go to infinity. So under this condition this has to be satisfied and which means that there is no rotation to this control volume caused by the imbalance of the forces okay if you also implement that I think now your number of unknowns in the stresses come down to totally 6 instead of 9 and uh, we will expand the forces uh, uh, and equate them to the total derivative the total derivative uh, we all know that we can write your du for example by dt as a partial derivative with respect to time plus the spatial derivatives like this okay so on so forth uh, for the accelerations in the in the other uh, directions as well now so this is converting the Lagrangian framework to an Eulerian framework so if you equate them to the corresponding forces in the direction we can write this as uh, so we have already mass into acceleration mass can be written as density times the volume okay so we can cancel the volume in both the sides so we will have rho du by dt should be equal to this term for the balance of the forces which is rho gx okay now what I am going to do is I am going to take out uh, pressure from the uh, uh, notation sigma xx and retain only the normal component of the viscous stress okay so I am going to say minus dp by dx correct plus d tau xx by dx plus d tau yx by dy plus you have d tau zx by dz so so on and so forth in the other directions I think you can fill in the blanks yourself so you can equate, equate that to the uh, summation of the forces and uh, now we are going to have to introduce some kind of an approximation to equate the forces in terms of uh, these uh, shear stresses we have to re rewrite them in terms of uh, the known quantities which you are supposed to calculate and uh, find out which which are these velocities okay so the velocities are the quantities which you fundamentally calculate okay whereas uh, the stresses are something which you do not know okay so we have to equate the stresses to these uh, quantities which you probably know after the end of solution and uh, the, so that is therefore there has to be a relationship invoked to equate the uh, to re to relate these uh, stresses in terms of the velocities so that is what we are going to invoke this approximation as a Newtonian fluid okay so one of the important so so far we have not invoked any great assumptions right we have considered all the forces we have made sure we have balanced them properly we have not neglected anything we have not made any fundamental assumption here except that we are working on a Cartesian framework but now the first assumption is going to be that we will take a consideration for a Newtonian fluid and for a Newtonian fluid so we have to write down the relation between the stresses and the corresponding strain rates okay so these are given for a Newtonian fluid in the following manner So your normal stresses sigma xx you can write your pressure plus your uh, normal viscous stress that is your tau xx which is written in terms of uh, two coefficient of viscosities the, okay so I am going to use the symbol lambda for one coefficient of viscosity in fact it is usually called the second coefficient of viscosity okay so times the divergence of velocity. 
to which in Cartesian coordinate system if you expand it will be like this plus you have your main coefficient of viscosity nu okay. So there will be there will be a 2 nu du by dx. Similarly if I go ahead and write the relationship in the other directions you can write the same thing the di divergence term will be there as it is. plus you have 2 nu into so can you guess what should be hmm? del del v by del y okay similarly if you write in the z direction Okay, so these are valid for a Newtonian fluid and uh, how about the shear stresses okay so the shear stress can also be expanded in a similar form for a Newtonian fluid so let me erase uh, these portions so we have tau xy we have already shown that for uh, inducing uh, no rotational force on the control volume this should be equal to tau y x now that is given as a relation between the stress and the strain rate as this dv by dx plus du by dy similarly tau xz should be can you guess the terms here. So dW dx plus du by dz okay good so you have the final term what is the final term you have tau yz tau zy that should be nu so this should be dv by for example dz plus dw by dy. So this is a closure now we got the closure problem and we closed it using the Newtonian fluid approximation where we are relating the stresses to the strain rates by this okay so this is also an approximation if, if you work with non Newtonian fluids okay then uh, you cannot apply this kind of relationship between uh, that is this is almost saying you have a linear relationship between the stress and the strain rate okay now what are these lambda and nu here okay so lambda denotes if you come to this uh, right here so this new as you all know this is your absolute viscosity right so this is also called as your shear viscosity sometimes which you are all familiar with when you say viscosity is the property of the fluid you talk about the absolute viscosity or the shear viscosity now you have also introduced another coefficient here which is the lambda which is actually the bulk viscosity this is sometimes referred to as the bulk viscosity also it is more commonly referred to as the second coefficient of viscosity okay so there is still a lot of debate on uh, the purpose of uh, introducing these two viscosities and uh, what is the role of uh, the second coefficient of viscosity anyway so in order to finally close this you also need to you know that nu is a property of the fluid so you also have to introduce a relationship between the lambda and nu okay so that is introduced by what is called as stokes hypothesis so we are introducing approximations one after the other so the stokes hypothesis states so this is an hypothesis you know it is uh, you can see it from the name you know stokes hypothesis means you know, people have not exactly verified it it's mathematical convenience to reduce the number of unknowns and what stokes says that if you introduce the fact that 3 lambda plus 2 nu equal to 0 that means your lambda is equal to minus 2 by 3 nu okay so this will give you a nice form of uh, the relationship between uh, sigma and uh, the strain rates convenient to suit your uh, uh, things to simplify a little bit 
and uh, in fact when we do that we can uh, we can also rewrite uh, we can now uh, plug in for these stresses in terms of the strain rates okay now i am going to rewrite them in terms of the strain rates rather than the stresses so for the x momentum i'll replace the derivatives of these uh, stresses in terms of the strain rate so i can say d by dx okay so new into 2 du by dx minus 2 by 3 into del dot p so which is the divergence the divergence is actually given by this term right here this is the del dot v term okay and uh, 2 by 3 comes because your lambda is equal to minus 2 by 3 nu okay apart from that uh, you also have your uh, du by dx 2 nu du by dx okay that is uh, essentially coming from this term right here okay so i'm just grouping the terms under the normal stress okay uh similarly if you expand that in terms of uh, shear stress and write in terms of the uh strain rates you get d by dy into nu so what should be the term so you have your tau xy is equal to tau yx so i can write this as d by dy nu into what dv by dx plus du by dy so i can also go ahead and complete the third term d by dz of tau zx should be equal to tau xz that will be dw that is new times dw by dx plus du by dz okay so it's a very lengthy expression uh so this is the x momentum equation so which is uh, coming to a more familiar form right so if we started with uh, putting the stresses and now we have invoked the approximation of stokes and the newtonian fluid and finally we have we are writing this in terms of uh, uh strain rates so we will uh, simplify uh, one by one gradually so we will write the y momentum equation similarly you have rho d v by dt so that should be rho gy minus dp by dy okay plus d by dx of so can you tell me the term that should come new into there should is, is there a 2 here for the y momentum what is the term corresponding to d by dx in the y momentum tau y x right so tau y x and tau x y are the same okay so this should be dv by dx plus du by dy all right plus so d by dy so now you have your normal stresses okay so you have new into 2 dv by dy minus 2 by 3 divergence of velocity plus you have d by dz mu into hmm dw by is it uh, dw by dx dy plus dv by dz okay so you can write the z momentum similarly i'm i'm not going to do it i'll uh, give you a couple of minutes to write down the z momentum also the same manner yes the stokes hypothesis which has been shown right now has it been experimentally proven at least uh, to be found close to the actual value like is lambda found to close to minus 2 by 3 mu because you can't simply accept such a yes that is true uh, well stokes hypothesis has not been proven directly but the final reduced form of the navier stokes equation which you get after in invoking the stokes hypothesis is definitely agreeing very well with the experimental data okay so that shows that stokes hypothesis is pretty good
Now Stokes when he showed the hypothesis he did not do experiments to confirm his hypothesis. He just proposed based, based on some intuition and based on the structure of the Navier-Stokes and later when you use this equation and solve them entirely. So you are seeing that uh, you get very good uh, agreement with the experimental data so that itself confirms okay. Okay so now I, I hope that you have completed the Z momentum. Now what we will do is uh, this is still not the simplified form of the Navier-Stokes that we would like to use okay and as I said uh, we will be focusing on uh, primarily incompressible flows. Now this, this is valid for both compressible and incompressible flows. We will make introduce the another approximation that we will be looking at only incompressible flows. So for that you will see that magically many of the terms drop out especially the divergence term should drop out because it satisfies the incompressible continuity <coughs> equation right. So you have your divergence term which drops out from all these equations and uh, you can also group uh, the terms in such a manner. So here for example okay if you look at this terms right here okay you can write this as uh, d by dx of uh, dv by dy plus you have uh, d by dx of uh, du by d by dy of du by dx plus you will have similarly d by uh, d, dw by dz into d by dx. So all these terms once again you can take uh, d by dx common and you have du by dx plus dv by dy plus dw by dz. So that will again satisfy the incompressible continuity that will drop out. So finally when you uh, write only the retain only the necessary terms you will have rho du by dt is equal to rho gx minus dp by dx plus mu times d square u by dx square plus d square v by dy square plus d square w by dz square. So this will be your x momentum, your y momentum will be so this will all be u in terms of u I am sorry okay. So this will be in terms of V Okay, so I think uh, you can relate and verify the terms once again. Okay, so you should uh, have this term knocked out, and then uh, you have d square u by dx square. Uh, you have d square u by dy square. You have d square u by. So you can take d by dx of uh, du by dx, dv by dy, dw by dz, which will disappear. So from each of these uh, momentum equations, you will have uh, you know you will satisfy continuity here as well as if you group the terms together like that okay. So hope all of you got it okay so the remaining terms will just be the Laplacian operator okay. So this is the more familiar form I guess correct when, when you start with the analytical solution of equations uh, you are more used to this form right for incompressible flows we can write also this form in terms of a coordinate free representation you know that is what we want to do if you want to apply this in all the coordinate systems so in a coordinate free representation So we can write this as dv by dt and v is a vector here indicating a velocity in any direction that should be equal to I am dividing throughout by rho so that will be g vector minus 1 by rho into how can I write the, uh, the pressure gradient del p 
okay and uh, the term here d square u by dx square and so on so forth this is nothing but the Laplacian operator del square and the corresponding v vector. So this is a very compact notation which indicates the momentum in any direction that you consider in any co coordinate system. You have to use the corresponding uh, the, the derivative operator as well as the Laplacian operator in that particular coordinate system and you will write those equations in either cylindrical or spherical coordinate system okay so so what we will be doing mostly in our uh, course is we will be focusing on the incompressible form of the navier stokes equation and we will also apply this to two dimensional flows so therefore the third derivative will all be neglected okay so that will be the compact form of the navier stokes that we will be considering so uh, with this uh, we have completed the momentum equation derivation very quickly let me start the energy equation derivation okay which is more important because you have uh, probably gone through the momentum and continuity in your earlier courses also. Any question on the derivation part I think it is very clear right you have already done it so it is just a reconfirmation of what you have learnt. Uh, let us start with the energy equation. Now once you understand the momentum equation clearly I think the energy equation just follows only you should know the contributions to the energy okay what are all the uh, components of uh, the energy so let me erase okay so when we come to energy we have to be very clear what is the balance of energy that we want to do so once again just like we have a mass balance we will write down the first law of thermodynamics for a control volume so which is nothing but the energy balance okay so what does the first law of thermodynamics say for a open system the, the rate of change of energy within the control volume should be equal to the net efflux of energy across the control volume boundaries okay so this is a very compact uh, way of phrasing the first law let us expand upon the term efflux of energy so there are many contributions to that uh, so what it says clearly is that your rate of change I am not using notations right now I will introduce the notations one by one rate of change of energy in a control volume should be equal to your energy in or rate of energy in minus rate of energy out okay so this is represented in uh, rate term so therefore I should say rate of energy right energy which is instantaneous so per time you know in a given time the energy which is basically crossing the control volume boundaries now when I talk about the this is nothing but the efflux of energy right totally so this is your energy efflux okay so now this efflux of energy has uh, the following components okay so let us look at first the energy and its constituents you can uh, use the uh, notation E to denote energy per unit should it be per unit volume or unit mass per unit mass okay so that should uh, have contributions from what so suppose if you look at the energy of a system so the total energy has contributions from its internal energy let me call that as u this is the internal energy per unit mass plus you have the kinetic and potential energy terms okay so I am going to put the kinetic energy term here u square plus v square plus w square by 2 this is also these are per unit mass 
okay so what i'm going to do i have not included the potential energy term here because i'm going to consider potential energy term under work okay because already you have the forces which are acting on the control volume and they do some work and gravitational force is one of them so i'm going to consider that as a part of the work rather than as a part of the total energy contributing to the temperature of the system okay so anyway it will all come in the balance of energy so it's not lost anywhere so this is the definition of energy i'm going to use so therefore so the initial energy of the control volume will be what so if i know this is the energy per unit mass for the entire control volume what will be the energy hmm into mass so that will be density times the volume times this energy right so rho e into delta x delta y delta z right so this is going to be the energy possessed by the control volume at some starting time from which you are calculating the change in the energy after a time delta t okay so the final energy of the control volume after some time delta t you want to see what is the energy at that point okay so that will be rho e delta x delta y delta z and so how should i so i should use the taylor series expansion okay if i think that the time is infinitesimally small i can write the taylor series expansion right so plus d by dt of rho e delta x delta y delta z into delta t okay so therefore your rate of change of energy of the system will be your final minus initial so your so that will be what d by dt of rho e okay and uh, multiplied by delta x delta y delta z delta t now where your e is uh, expanded into you no know, constituents of internal energy and the kinetic energy in that manner so i can i can also write this as d by dt of uh, rho times u plus u square plus v square plus w square by 2 okay into delta x delta y delta z so this rate of change from no you are calculating at later time minus the initial time okay so yeah if you have a energy which is depleted it will be negative if you have energy which is gained it will be rate of change will be positive right okay so this is the rate of energy change of energy which we are uh, balancing on on this on the left hand side with the energy efflux terms now when you look at the efflux of energy the net efflux of energy so you have components of what so what are the things which can uh, come in and leave the control volume so one is the components of internal energy and kinetic energy itself can be carried by advection process okay so you have efflux of your kinetic energy your internal energy right due to advection okay and uh, you also have uh, components of what apart from the components of the energy which constitute the total energy of the system what else can change the energy of the control volume hm conduction so that is basically a heat transfer process so you can have heat transfer which is happening along across the control volume boundaries you can also have work transfer okay when you talk about energy you have both components of heat and work okay so you have efflux of these also you have uh, plus you have efflux of heat okay now efflux of heat is not happening due to advection okay it is 
purely a diffusion process or a conduction process okay so plus you have efflux of work and now I how efflux of work is happening already you have these forces acting on the boundaries and so they do some work on the control volume boundaries okay now the contributions of each of these now efflux of internal and kinetic energies is easy to write so I am just going to write it down so can you guess how the structure of efflux of internal and kinetic energy should look so it is like uh, I am saying if you take this control volume you have the flux of internal plus kinetic energy which is entering for example on this left x plane and on this side this will be rho u internal plus kinetic plus d by dx of rho u internal plus kinetic into delta x right you have entire thing multiplied by delta y delta z so similarly in this direction you know you can also write this as rho v into internal plus kinetic energy into delta x delta z this will be rho v all right so similarly in the third direction you can write it apart from the efflux of uh, the uh, energy of the system efflux of the energy which is coming due to advection you also have the heat transfer so you can say this is uh, probably qx that is the uh, heat flux which is uh, crossing this uh, particular left x plane in the x direction multiplied by delta y delta z okay so this is the heat transfer rate in this direction so on this particular plane this will be qx double prime plus dq x double prime by dx into delta x into delta y delta z okay so I will probably erase okay similarly you have uh, conduction of heat in the other directions as well so I am representing heat flux in this direction into delta x delta z will be the heat heat flow rate or heat transfer rate and similarly you can express this as and also in third direction you can do the same apart from this you also have work transfer okay which you can write it down So work transfer in both the directions okay so now so this is the complicated part of the uh, derivation of energy equation you know you have heat transfer rates you have work transfer rates you have flux of uh, energy everything coming uh, you know into the control volume uh, control volume and leaving at the same time so you have to balance all of them in one single equation so that is why it gets a little more tedious than uh, you know the continuity and x momentum and because the momentum as such is directional so you can very easily balance in each direction whereas here you have to include all the contributions into one single equation okay anyway so we will uh, stop at this point and tomorrow we will continue and uh, this is from the uh, Eulerian point of view we will also do a derivation starting from the Reynolds transport theorem which is completely coordinate free and it connects the Lagrangian to the Eulerian so from there we can reach to the same conclusions okay so thank you so much